Let's uh, go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We are, uh, the title is Abound in Grace. We're talking about the offering that Paul was raising. And so in our outline, this puts us into the third major section of 2 Corinthians, the chapter 8 and chapter 9. Today we uh, hope to conclude that. I have a couple notes on this. At this point in Paul's ministry, he is working on raising funds for the church in Jerusalem. It is meant to build stronger ties between the Gentile Christians in the, his churches and the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. Our study today concludes the section on the offering in 2 Corinthians. Now, when we talk about that divide, Paul worked on that. If you study the book of Ephesians, he's talking about the doctrine of the church. There he especially emphasizes the unity of uh, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. It's, they're no longer, there's no longer a divide. And it's interesting as you look at church history, uh, the, so many things were done so badly, and the, the church, I think in reaction to previous years of bad treatment from the Jews, some of them, reacted badly towards the Jews of their day. And so there was a very, you know, like, you, you know, uh, they, they really didn't have a right view of Christianity, I think, is what it came down to, many of them, especially those in power. And so it caused a lot of trouble in the world. But one of the big things that Paul is doing through this offering is he's seeing the whole group, like Gentile Christians and Corinth, they're the same as Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. And when one part of the body is hurting, then the other part needs to supply the need. And the Christians throughout the world have done this through history, the real believers. They've tried to help and be a benefit to those in other lands who don't have as much and need some help in one way or another to help them get a leg up, not necessarily a handout, but a, you know, a way to start. And uh, so that's what he's talking about here. So we're going to go ahead. I'm going to read uh, the first few verses, first five verses of Second Corinthians, and then we'll have a discussion of, uh, of, the, of this uh, section. For it is superfluous for me to write to you about this ministry to the saints. For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the Macedonians, namely that Achaia has been prepared since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I have sent the brethren in order that our boasting about you may not be made empty in this case, so that, as I was saying, you may be prepared. Otherwise, if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to speak of you, will be put to shame by this confidence. So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift, so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected <laughs> By covetousness. So there's a lot of things in here. We're just sort of going over the surface of this, but uh, let's just talk about this. I'm, this is, I call this section necessary preparation for Paul's visit. So when Paul says that it's superfluous for him to talk about the offering, what is he saying? Christy? Unnecessary. Okay, it's unnecessary, yes, but why does he use this kind of language? Because he's giving them confidence. He has confidence that they're going to do the right thing. Okay, he's confident that they're going to do the right thing. But notice, I want you to notice that when he says, it's superfluous for me to talk about this, and then he talks about it. <laughs> okay, so what is that? What is that doing? Uh, double speaking. Huh? Double speaking. <laughs> she says double speaking? Well, not quite double speaking. It's a, the, the word they, that I saw in the commentaries, they says, this is emphasis by understatement. Okay, so it's superfluous. I don't really need to be talking to you about this, but I'm going to talk to you about this because I do need to talk to you about this. That's what he's saying. But he is aware of this. There's been this division between him and them. So he's bringing it in in language that allows them to save some face. So I don't really need to talk to you about this, but let's talk about it. So he's... Yes, David. Yeah, so it's sort of a disarming way of... Right, it's a disarming way of bringing it up. That's right, because there is, there has been contention. So he's saying, okay, so let's talk about this, because, and he's reminding them as we go through the passage that, you know, you did promise. He said that earlier in chapter 8, you know, and he said that in chapter 
We had uh, 1 Corinthians 16. Now, you, you made this promise. And so, uh, so he's, he is holding them to their promise, but he's doing it. He's trying to do it in a way that couches it in a language so that he's not just saying, look, you guys said you do this, so you better do it. I mean, when somebody says that to you, what happens? Yeah, barriers come up. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, uh, you know, people will say, I, I really don't need to say this to you. <laughs> then they're going to lay the whammy on you about something they need to say. Yes? If it wasn't Paul, it would almost come across as manipulative. Yeah, in a way it would. But there is such a thing as... Uh, Diplomacy, like there's a right way and a wrong way to say things. So, salted. pardon me. Salted is what he says. In his, let your conversation be salted. Yeah, let your conversation be salted with grace. Yeah. You know, and I, uh, I mean, there's many different relationships you have in the world, and this reminds me of a situation I vividly remember. I had this appointment when I was selling real estate. I had a out on Iowa head. There was this guy. I don't know if I had the listing or if he was talking about giving me a listing, but the guy was quite combative in all our conversations. So I remember driving out there on Machosan Road, thinking about how I was going to say this, what I had to say. So that, and so we got there, we had our meeting, and I think I got the listing, or I got whatever it was I was after. I remember it was very successful. But you do, you know, you know, there are, there are, uh, there are things, if you want to get a message across, there is a good way to say it and a bad way to say it. And we often have to think about this. And I think, like we learn soul winning presentations, there's different ones you've learned. And the idea of those conversations, the way you're taught to uh, say things, is to help to disarm the person who's, who you're talking to. It's so that you are, uh, so that they'll be willing to listen. Right? It, it doesn't, it's not simply um, that we're trying to manipulate them, but we're trying to gain their hearing. And that, I think that's what Paul is doing here. Okay? But I, I do take the point. We do have to understand, you know, there is a right way and a wrong way to say things, and we have to be careful. All right, so the next question, what report is Paul giving in verse 2, and why is he giving it? Okay, so verse 2. For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the Macedonians, namely that Achaia has been prepared since last year. Okay, so what report is Paul giving there? What is he talking about? My question might be a little obscure as I think about it. Christy? Their zeal? Their zeal? Okay, he's reporting about their zeal. Addie, you're going to add something? And how their activities are impacted the people of Macedonia to action. Okay, so they're, they're, that report has motivated the people of Macedonia. So who is he talking to? Who is he giving the report to? Pardon me? No, no, he's talking about the Corinthians, and who is he talking to? The Macedonians. So what he's saying is uh, that, you know, he says, I don't need to talk about this to you, but I... I I, but I want to remind, I let you know that I have boasted about you to the Macedonians, and that motivated them. Okay, so so he's he's saying I used you as an example. All right, and and he's giving this as a, as another motivation. Okay, I bragged on you. Now don't let me down. It's, this is the underlying, the unspoken part of that. Uh, of that uh, statement, because he, you know, they've, it has, you know, their zeal, their initial zeal has said, all right, if they're going to be a part of it, we'll be a part of it. So, all right, so then in verse 3, when Paul says, I have sent the brethren, to whom is he referring? I have sent the brethren. Who's he talking about? You have to think back to last week. This is a review question. It goes all the way back to last week. Pardon me? Titus. Titus. And? We don't know names. You've got to think about There's another way to describe Okay, the other ones. Okay, Debbie says. <laughs> okay, so what we have in Titus, or in the previous chapter, we have Titus. We have the famous brother, verse uh, 18 of chapter, 
We sent along with him the brother whose fame in all things of the gospel has spread through all the churches, the famous brother. And then in verse 22, we have sent with them, with those two, our brother who has a good record. Okay, so those are the three. So th he says, so he's referring to them. I have sent the brethren. All right, so why did he send this team to Corinth, the latter part of verse 3? To collect. <laughs> yeah, he says to collect. Okay. All right. To, okay, so that, um, so that you may be prepared. You're ready. Okay? Because I don't want my, you know, I've been talking you up to the Macedonians, and I don't want the Macedonians to show up. That's really the next question. Uh, so what does Paul mean by verse 4? What is he saying there? So this will give us the whole picture. Yeah, they're not ashamed of the Macedonians show up. So Paul is saying, look, the Corinthians, they have promised a big offering. And when we go down there, they're going to have it ready for us. And so there's some representatives that are coming from Macedonia who are official you know, offering overseers for the portion that's coming from Macedonia, and they're coming down with Paul. And they're going to show up in Corinth, and he says, I want you to be ready because I don't want to show up. It'll be embarrassing for you and it'll be embarrassing for me having bragged on you to show up and you're not ready. Does that make sense? Now, all of this, and this is superfluous. He doesn't need to say this, but I want to let you know this is what I've been talking about you. All right? And there's a, there's a motivation, motivating factor. Like, okay, be ready. So, yes, well, he's saying there's a chance that some Macedonians will come with you. Right. But he's not really saying oh, that's right. He's not saying that. You're right. <coughs> if any Macedonians come with me, so it's possible they'll come and find you unprepared. He says, so, you know, let's not be in a situation where things are going to not show well for us. Okay, so Paul summarizes his plans again in verse 5 and expresses his desire for the gift. Uh, um, what does he desire? most of all about the gift. What does he desire? Now obviously he wants the offering so that he can, he has purposes for the offering. But was it, what does he want? Yes, Eddie. He probably wants it to be from, given out of free will and not grudgingly. That's right, that's exactly. Given out of free will and not grudgingly. So a bountiful gift not affected by covetousness. And uh, so there's, that's a teaching and he's going to go in this next section he, that we're going to look at, he's going to go into some principles about giving in general. So he's talking about the specific offering in the first five verses. He's uh, talked a little bit in the previous chapter, as you recall, about the specific offering. But now he's going to talk about the giving in general. So let's go to that section, beginning in verse 6. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He, sows, he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. So these, this is mostly general principles about giving, and it, they can apply to any offering that you or I give even today. All right, so what principle of giving is expressed in verse 6? You reap what you sow, all right? So there is a reward uh, for the giving, right? There's a reward for the giving. And so he encourages, the, what is he encouraging amongst the givers? Generosity, I heard somebody say that. Does this mean that generosity is measured by the size of the gift? No. I don't think so. I guess it's more of the intention. 
Yeah, and the intentions, the intentions of the heart. And we have the famous story of the widow with her two mites in the temple that Jesus observed. Remember that one. She gave all she had. All right, now, um, now here's the next question. What is the harvest? Note it says, he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. What is the harvest that comes from giving? That is, what does it mean to reap bountifully? Treasure laid up in heaven. Okay, is that treasure laid? Are you asking that as a question, or are you are you are you making a statement? It's a suggestion. It's a suggestion. Okay. Ready? Anybody else want to make a suggestion? Marlene. The blessings. Okay, so the blessings that come from giving. All right. So anybody else? I agree. You agree with both of those. All right, uh, Lola. Like to reap far more than you anticipated. Okay. There'll be more, far more than you anticipated, James. Well, it just makes me think salvation. Okay, well, salvation, sure. Okay, so here's the thing. He, the Bible is not teaching. The Bible is not, now, did I put this? Yes, I put it in this answer. So here, I'll give you my answer. That There is a bountiful blessing that comes from the giving, but it does not say cash in equals more cash out. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, in other words, if you wanted to get rich, this is the theory, okay, I'll give everything I have to God, and he'll give me more. Some people, I don't know if anybody really would have that kind of idea, but that's not, that's not what God is teaching us about giving. He's teaching us to be generous. Oh, that's prevalent. Planting seed money. That's right, planting seed money. And the health and wealth gospel is teaching this. Oh, if you'll just you know, send money to me, I'll send you a prayer cloth, and God will make you rich. That's not what the purpose of Christianity is, number one, to be rich. And number two, there is such a thing as treasure laid up in heaven, as Daryl said. There is a blessing for giving right now. There is, we can take part. You know, when we hear stories from our missionaries about people who have been saved, uh, work that's been done in various places. I mean, that's a blessing. We get to be a part of that. I mean, they feel to me, as I hear from them, like they're a part of us. Now, we're not, we don't have a huge part in all that they do, but we have a part. They're part of us. So there's a blessing in giving to that, and we like to do that. Because there, there's such a blessing. But not only is that, that there is a, the, as Jesus said, there's riches, a treasure laid up for us in heaven for the things that we do. Um, and so, and if we approach giving, if we approach the offering as a mercenary thing, that, well, okay, if I just give, you know, I know God's going to give to me, that's, that's not the right way to look at the offering. Okay? All right. Uh, where am I? Verse 7. What is the second principle of giving? Verse 7. Cheerfulness. Cheerfulness. Okay. And uh, most preachers will say here, you know, the, the word, the root word for, or the Greek word for cheerful here gives us an English word. You know what that is? Anybody remember? Okay, the Greek word is hilarion, from which we get hilarious. And they'll say, God loves a hilarious giver. That's not what it says. <laughs> okay, but, it's, but it does mean that this says speaking about the spirit. It, there, there's this, that's the... Uh, the, gener the generous spirit, I mean, you know, you want to find opportunities to give, okay? Um, all right, so this, uh, oh, there's something else in this verse too. Uh, besides the, uh, I'm sort of answering the next question, what is the spiritual emphasis of this principle? The spirit, cheerfulness, and giving. So, uh, but what else is there about this principle in verse 7? Besides the attitude in the, the purpose. That's what God desires of every giver. That's right. Okay, so to plan our giving. Okay, it's, it's um, you know, it's a decision. It's not something, you know, uh, you know, the New Testament doesn't, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament religion, giving was regulated just like everything else. In the New Testament, we are not given those regulations. We are just encouraged to give with a good heart, and make a plan. Be purposeful. And um, it's not simply an emotional, uh, think, well, whatever the Lord leads me, that's what I'll do. But it's actually, he, I think he means here to think through what you can do right now with the resources you have 
and have a plan to give because that's what God wants you to do. All right, verse 8, the third principle of giving. What's that one? Okay, God will supply you what you need for what, though? Uh, for every good deed, it says at the end. All right, so... Pardon me? Well, we'll abound in good deeds, but there is something else about this. Let me just uh, see what I put in my notes so I can make sure I say this right. All right, God is able to give you both opportunities and means to minister by giving to others. And so I have an illustration in my notes, something that when we were in uh, students at in, uh, university, most of us did not have much money. Okay, there were some families uh, who were better off than others, of course, but most students in a Bible school are there by the skin of their teeth, and they're always worried about paying their bill every month. And, uh, and some work their way through. Now, uh, I was one of those kids. My dad was fairly well off, so I didn't have to work. But here's the thing. It's not that I had a lot of money either. I mean, my dad wasn't just, <laughs> he said, all right, here, spend it. No, that's not what he was doing. But, but the, I recall testimony after t testimony because every year there would be some project that the school was working on. Uh, for improving their service, improving the work of the Lord. So they have, they'd have a special offering at what they, their week when they had special services called Bible conference. This is a big deal every year. So students would pray, Lord, if you could just give me a little extra money so I can have something to give. And so and they would, and you would hear testimonies. Well, I got this extra job and I was able to give something towards the offering. Or, I, uh, or somebody sent me a check in the mail and it paid my bill and I have a little something to give towards the offering. So it says, God is able to uh, make all grace abound to you so that you may have abundance for every good deed. So God will help you to give if you should be taking part. And that's what you should be praying about. In verse 9, he quotes Psalm 112, verse 9. How does it support the principles of giving? This is a little bit more obscure, this quotation, but it's in line with what he has just said about God giving abundance for every good deed. James. His righteousness remaineth forever. Okay, his righteousness remaineth forever, but what... No, he's talking about, <clears throat> oh, well, <clears throat> let me see what I put in my notes. Well, okay, so it is, it is, uh, he's talking about the believer. The believer scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. In other words, there is a spiritual blessing that God gives to you for what you have done to give to others. It is a righteous thing to do. Okay, so it is a little obscure, but he is, he is saying this. He, when he says, as it is written, this is given in support of what he's just said. So he's saying, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you can take part, so that you can have participate in good deeds. And as you do that, he is going to uh, he is going to bless you with righteousness. This is a righteous thing to do. Okay, So it's a little harder to see because when you get these Old Testament quotes, you have to think through exactly why it's given. All right, Chrissy. And it's, in verse 10, it says, the harvest of your righteousness. So yeah, that's right. That's right. The harvest of your righteousness. That's right. Okay. And it does speak to this, uh, these blessings that come in heaven. So verse 10 and 11, as we've mentioned, what promise is Paul making? as he closes out the principles of giving, verse 10 to 11. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. 
You will be rich, enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. So what promise is Paul making here as he closes out these principles? Thinking in terms of what we've already said, Christy. God's the one who supplies. God supplies, and but... We don't be stingy with it. We will. That's right, and we, we give out as he has given to us. But, rem- but he's also supporting the idea that you will, it's, even if you don't have ability to give right now in your current circumstances, if you will give yourself to God, he will increase, he will multiply your seed to increase your ability to give. So let's say that, uh, now we've never really had a fundraising program with our church. Uh, that I recall, maybe when we bought the building, I don't remember if we had any special offerings, did we? I don't think we had been saving for many years. I don't think we've ever really had one of those campaigns. But let's say that the Lord were to lead us to, um, well, let's say we grew by, we've been packing it in here lately. Let's say we packed it in even more and we were overflowing and we really needed more space. That would cost a lot of money. So, the Lord would lead us to perhaps have a special fund. Now, we're all giving to support the ministry as is right now. But as we have a special need, we might say, Lord, I can't, I don't have enough to give to that special need, but I'd like to give to it. And so we would pray to God, we would seek ways, and he would supply. I think this is what it's saying again. That's the assurance. God is... God, God wants you to give, but he'll also enable you to give. Does that make sense? Yeah. Haiti. And are we able to tie this to uh, Luke 6 that says, give and it shall be given unto you. That's right, yes. And I just shake it together and run it over. That's right. I think so, yes. I think that principle is added into this. Give and it shall be given unto you. Uh, and all those things you said, I don't know how to lose my trying to say it. Yeah. That's right. You got it. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Now, and it's, uh, uh, like in all these principles, like I want to emphasize, it's not, he's, I have heard Christians say things that, and I'm not just talking health and wealth gospel people. I have heard sincere Christians say, you know, I, I just give and God has always supplied my need. But you don't want to, you don't want to be in a position where you're sort of testing God and just okay, I'll give God everything, and then I'll I, and He'll provide everything. Uh, that's not the lead, that's not what the Scripture leads us to do. But also, it there is it's not a with it's not mater, we're not necessarily talking about a material reward for giving. So, in other words, if we give if we give from a sincere heart with generosity, as as God has led us and as God has enabled us, then there is a blessing for us. But it isn't necessarily more money. And often it isn't at all more money. <laughs> okay? It's just, okay, now I, you know, I've had that opportunity to serve and now I'm, that's good. Okay? And what a blessing. And God will reward me someday, perhaps. Okay? So that's the, that's the, uh, the thing we want to stress here. We're not trying to, and, we, and sometimes people have misused these passages, I believe, to manipulate people into giving money to things that aren't necessarily the Lord's work. Okay? All right. Uh, Debbie. Well, the, <clears throat> the promise in verse 10 at the end there is that he promised him to increase the harvest of your righteousness. That's yeah. Pretty, uh, pretty, that's worth a lot more than money. That's worth a lot more than money, yes. The harvest of righteousness is a lot worth a lot more than money. Was there another hand somewhere, I thought, as I, I was looking down there and I saw some movement, but maybe you were just scratching your head, whoever it was. Okay, so the last few verses of the chapter. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. While they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So just a few questions on these last few verses. What will this offering produce in others in verse 12? Because it's all this to give thanks to God. 
others to give thanks to God. Now, he has a specific audience in mind in this case. Who is that audience? The saints in Jerusalem. Now, they are in dire straits. And this is, there's various reasons. We've talked about this before. But he's saying, what is going to happen? The ministry of this service is not only supplying their needs, but it will overflow through many thanksgivings to God. So it will supply their needs, but it will bring about worship from them, thanksgiving to God from them. And then, uh, what, what, uh, why will others give thanks to God for the Corinthian giving? Verse 13. They'll glorify God for what, though? For your obedience. For your obedience. Keep working through it. Your obedience to what? To the gospel of Christ. To the gospel of Christ. What are they saying? Here's the thing. Here's these Jewish Christians. How many of them were really enthusiastic about Peter preaching to Gentiles? Most of them weren't, right? And then that Paul... And he's out there amongst all those Gentiles all the time. And there's a little, there's this tension. Paul is teaching. There's, there's one body in Christ. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. But there is this tension. And as they see your liberality, he says, they will glorify God for your obedience to their, your confession of the gospel of Christ. In other words, your confession of being a Christian is not just words. You really mean it. You're really a part of this body. You see us as part of this body. And so it will about redound to the unity of believers, though they're Jew those from the Jewish background. I mean, they, they, all these Gentile believers really freaked them out. They really did. We don't uh, fully appreciate what a transition those Jewish Christians had to undergo to accept Gentile fellow believers in one new body of the church. I mean, it, it's something that just doesn't compute for us. I mean, we're 2,000 years away and we're out of that culture. You know, <clears throat> there is something for us, I suppose, when we see somebody come into church, like we have a culture of church. At church, we tend to dress a little better than we do regular days uh, of the week. And somebody comes in and maybe they're not from our background and they're Somebody invites them in, maybe they're, and they feel out of place. So what do we do? We try to welcome them. We try to encourage them to hear the word. We want to them to, we want to, we, this is not, you know, what our th culture is not the issue. The issue is their soul, right? So that's, and that's, and so the Gentile, Jewish Christians, they're, they're, when they see these Gentiles coming in, and they have all these Gentile ways, but they show that they really are a part of the body. That's really an amazing thing. So that's what he's talking about. All right. I'm sort of getting off there. So yes. Yeah, it's a demonstration of the reality of their conversion. That's right. All right. And then verse 14, what benefit would accrue to the, thanks, uh, to the Corinthians? Well, increasing the harvest of their righteousness, but there's something else here. They'll be praying for you. They'll be praying for you. See that? Well, they, the Jerusalem Christians, by prayer on your Corinthian behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. So, that, so there is a, there is, there are people, there are people there who would be praying for them because of their generosity and their evidence of the gospel, uh, response to the gospel. And so then he concludes with this benediction. I mean, what does this refer to? Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Pardon? Well, we always compose. Yeah, but what is it talking about? Salvation. For all. Salvation for all in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not simply the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's the fact that he has saved, he's been willing to save Jews and Gentiles, bring them to Christ. So I have a quote from Constable here, the Corinthians did follow through and assemble their gift. 
It was only a few months after Paul penned 2 Corinthians that he wrote his epistle to the Romans. In that epistle, he said that the Christians of Macedonia and Achaia, which included Corinth, had made a contribution to the poor saints in Jerusalem. And you can look that up in Romans 15. Paul and his delegation then traveled back to Jerusalem from Corinth through Macedonia and Asia Minor. So that's laid out in Acts 20. The leaders of the Jerusalem church evidently received the gift gladly in Acts 21. Right, so that's, that's the process. But Paul's talking about this giving, and he's talking about it as a blessing that the Corinthians need to participate in. They've been out of sorts with him, and it's quite bold. I would say I would be chicken to raise this issue myself. I don't have the boldness of the Apostle Paul, but he has quite the boldness. He's been dealing with them about all these disagreements, and then he says, now, about this offering, and he teaches all these principles, and then he's going to turn the page and he's going to say, now, I am going to talk about these false teachers that are among you. Chapter 10. He's going, he, reconciliation, first seven chapters of first, Second Corinthians. The offering, chapter 8 and 9, now, these false teachers, and he is going to turn up the heat in the next chapter. Okay? So that's how Corinthians goes. Any final questions for today or comments? Okay, well, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the day you've given us. Thank you if we've studied your word, that it might be something that impresses us and uh, guides us in our own spiritual lives. We pray for your blessing on our church. Help us to be faithful in every aspect of ministry in our worship, in our giving, in our singing, in our prayers, in our preaching, in our witnessing. Lord, we pray that we might be an example of the believers and that we would see more souls come to Christ through this ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>